am here with uh, Rowan Stone from, really from Zencash. Uh, Rowan, tell us a little bit about Zencash. So Zencash started as a privacy-centric cryptocurrency, yep. and we quite early on decided that we needed to make sure that we maintain censorship resistance. Mm. So we decided to do that by incentivizing the setup of secure nodes, which is kind of our servers that hold the ledger and do computation bits and pieces. So we allocated 3.5% of block rewards, and we did that back in November, and quite quickly we got far more than what we expected. So we kind of hoped for three to 4,000 nodes. As of today, we have more nodes than Bitcoin. So we're sitting at 11,500 secure nodes. So that has pushed us from being having a long-term plan to move into kind of a platform space to immediately thinking about we need to create our ecosystem and we need to start building applications on top of it now. Sure. So what, tell, I see your message up here says a privacy platform for money, messages and media. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about those functions? Sure. So we're basically aiming to create a kind of inclusive ecosystem. Yeah. Um, the functions that we have already, we've got a, a secure messaging service. So that's snark based. Our privacy protocol is ZK Snarks. Um, and that just works through the wallet. So message field that you can send one to one or one to many. Um, we're then working on, I don't think you can see it over here. So we have Zen Hide, which is our domain fronting service. So domain fronting is about allowing access to the free internet in locations where there may be firewalls or whatever that prevents people from getting free access to the net. So China is a perfect use case for that. Um, Zen Pub, distributed file storage systems. It's about freedom of speech. It's about restoring the ability to say whatever you need to say without fear of repercussions. Um, or just store files in our giant network of nodes. Um, and then the last one is Zen Grid. So because our network of nodes has grown so quickly, we're talking about sharding off sections of that supercomputer, essentially, and renting computation as a service. Okay. So what kind of vision do you have for how that might look like in a general public use case in, say, I don't know, two, five years, ten years? Pick your time. Yeah, so long term, I mean, we, like I said it before, we want this to be a kind of permissionless ecosystem that anybody can participate in. So our foundation goals are about restoring freedom and keeping privacy and all the sort of things that everybody here is talking about, but we're actually trying to do it. Um, use cases are almost limitless. So at the moment, we're calling the shots with the cornerstones of our organization, the things that we believe in, and that's why these apps are all based around kind of freedom, inclusivity, and security. But longer term, we're going to open up the platform and allow anybody to develop applications on top of it. Okay. And when that happens, it becomes kind of anybody's game of which way it's going to go. Yeah, cool. um, so basically, you're trying to build the platform for other people to build the apps with which to use your core functionality. Is that right? Yeah. I prefer yeah. it to call it an ecosystem. Yeah. Um, but absolutely, it's a platform for yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For sure. So we released a new white paper just two, three weeks back. And that white paper is announcing uh, a new tier of Node. So we have secure nodes at the moment, 11,500 roughly. Super nodes are the new one. Um, higher stake requirements, higher specification for hardware for the server, and they'll allow us to start side chaining. So side chaining is absolutely massive for the project. That's what's going to allow us to open up and allow third party developers to develop applications on top of Zen. Um, but it's also going to allow us to do a whole bunch of stuff that we really need to do to push adoption. So, first couple of things we're working on is a collateralized price stable asset. So pegged to USD, denominated in Zen. For merchant adoption to really work, we need to get to a point where merchants can trust the value of a coin. If you sell a car and all of a sudden the, the, the value of the coins you receive drop 10%, you're going to be a little bit pissed off. So yeah, yeah. we need to get to a point where we can offer a price stable asset to the market. Yeah. And that's going to happen very, very soon. Right. Um, we're then going to be looking at a decentralized exchange, again, on a side chain. Um, and there's a whole bunch of other things that we're working on as well. Okay. So it sounds like quite a lot. Uh, yeah, I mean, we're at a point now where we have a team of 53 people, um, 26 developers. We operate as a full stack business, so we have properly professional organization with individual directors for each division. So it's actually pretty hard even for me to keep up with what's going on in every division because there's so much going on all at the same time, but it's really exciting. It's actually, I've spoken to a lot of blockchain projects and kind of organizational capacity, scalability, HR is still a big problem because Teams of developers kind of view the mission itself as being the glue for all of the the actual project, and they kind of forget that they're actually human beings that have to work together. And how have you been finding that in your organisation? So HR is definitely something that we need to up our game with. 
So at the moment, the divisional directors tackle HR for their divisions, and that's working pretty well. But we fully recognise, especially now that we're at a stage of having 50 odd people, that we need to pull in professional HR to deal with simple things like onboarding. So when you hire somebody new, you need to give them the, the full understanding of who we are, what we're about, and what we're trying to achieve, so that they're working in the same way and towards the same goal. Oh my God, we do this. We have the same. Uh feeling in our organisation. Absolutely, it's so important. The, the whole core message is integral to everything that happens. So if we don't have everybody in the organisation on the same page, we're not going to get where we need to go. So we need to up our game with HR. It's the only thing we don't currently have in our business. Um, so we're kind of doing it ourselves. The leadership team are all kind of ex-business owners and business managers. So we've done HR in many different formats before. We understand what needs to be done. but. It's finding time to do it properly when you don't have a dedicated resource. So we're now going to bring in a dedicated resource. And another thing is like where you've got uh, all your developers working on your code because you've got so much to do. You need like to bring in more developers, but then they're just working on the code. And you don't have enough time, space to train new developers because everyone's busy developing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So in a more general sense, let's step away a bit for Zencash. Just uh, whether it's your personal view or your organization's view. What do you think like the future of blockchain in general? Like how do you visualize what the exciting things about a few years time? How they how the, like kind of the our social and even financial legal or just maybe our social environment are going to change. I think the great thing about so blockchain as a whole is an absolutely massive talk. I mean there's loads of different use cases, but if we burn it down just into cryptocurrency specifically, I think it's got huge potential. I mean People always talk about banking the unbanked, but there aren't many projects actually actively recruiting people, putting boots on the ground in the countries that need people to be banked and making it happen. So that's one thing that we're going to be trying to focus on quite heavily. Um, and it will make an absolutely massive difference. Places like Venezuela, where the, the core currency they're working with is just completely out of control. It's completely unreliable and it's at a point where a good chunk of the population are actually using cryptocurrency already. And that's without real intervention from crypto projects putting boots on the ground and making it happen. Yeah, yeah. So in a way, they're, they're miles ahead of places like here yeah. in New York. Yeah. I'm a, I live in Lebanon at the moment. Even, I'm Australian. But, uh, I'm or, jealous of your food before you go any further. Absolutely. Australians or Lebanese? Lebanese. Absolutely Lebanese food. Yeah, Beautiful. Yeah. Lebanese. It's a good place to get fat. <laughs> uh, thankfully, I've tried to have a very restrictive diet. Otherwise, I'd be overwhelmed very quickly. Um, the uh, yeah, in Lebanon there's also like big refugee crisis coming from Syria, Palestine, and uh, as you were saying, like banking the unbanked, having rehabilitation possibilities like for refugees where they can, you know, if you've got things like title deeds on the ledger, records of where they're from, identity management, that stuff would be huge in that administration of actually like uh, humanitarian aid. And that's stuff that really excites me. So it's interesting to hear you say, talk about like Zen Pub and Zen Grid and Zen Hide, and then like actually humanitarian issues a thing. Uh, so what, what, can you tell me a little bit about the kind of, how you might put people on the ground for that? So our, our strategy for business development is to put boots on the ground in every single region. So the way we work it is typically if we're not there ourselves, we'll recruit a kind of country representative to kind of sniff out the area, figure out what's currently happening, what needs to be done. And then from there, we'll scale up to having a country manager, having a regional manager for that kind of area of the world. And we've done that in a number of locations already. So at the moment, we have a regional manager for CIS and, and Eastern Europe, for Central Europe, for Latin America and Americas. Um, and these guys are building teams in different locations. Next month, uh, in July, we're looking to do a kind of tour of Asia. And it's exactly the same thing. So we're going to visit South Korea, Japan, um, Hong Kong, China. Um, we're going to try our best to recruit some really talented people and start our outreach in those areas and really start breaking into those markets. But it's really, really important. Yeah, awesome. Now, uh, here's a kind of out of the blue question, but imagine another blockchain that you like. Anyone, pick one in your mind, and you could use their services or their functionality. What do you think would be a, uh, another blockchain that you like and that you think could add value to your own blockchain? So for me, interoperability is one of the biggest challenges we're going to face in the next year or so. So we'd have to be somebody working in that space. Um, so we have Cardano working in interoperability longer term. So they like to do things very methodically. Yeah. They like to do kind of research first, peer review, then develop. So it's much more longer term. I was speaking to the guys in Arc um, just pretty recently. Really, really nice guys. 
heavily working on interoperability, so that would be a prime example of where two projects could really come together and, and make some use, for sure. Did you know that the, the organization I work for, BlockNet, is interoperability protocol? Welcome! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh, we've already got a lot of interoperability functionality working now, so we should have a conversation longer after this interview. Definitely. But uh, but just on that topic of interoperability, I mean, we know that siloing is a problem and that we're going to need it. I would love to plug BlackNet more, but I feel like I would be kind of dishonouring the conversation, the tone of the conversation. So more, I would like to go uh, on to like, imagine you've already got interoperability. What would you like to add via that? To yours, how would you value add via that? So for me, tough question. It's a pretty tough question, yeah. But for me, interoperability isn't just between cryptocurrencies. Yeah. It has to be interoperability between legacy financial systems and cryptocurrency. And I think that's where we're really going to start getting mass adoption. Yeah. We need to make cryptocurrency much easier to access. Yeah. So we need to lower the technical barrier to entry. And we need to allow communication between new style finance and legacy finance yeah, systems. Right. And I think if we can crack that as an industry, I think it's everything else will start falling into place quite quickly. Cool. Well, that's a very nice summary. Um, thank you so much for your time. You. It's been a nice conversation.